It's time to rebuild. Woo! Okay. There will be a struggle. Uh, I can't cap it that way. It probably won't work in the first try. But the DIY immersion cooling experiments simply must progress. And that means I'm moving my fourth iteration out of the she shed and back into the warehouse to test and understand the next phase, which is still a single phase, but a two loop immersion system. Two loops. My name's Nicholas Johnson. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm trying to catch the decade investor and you're next, Andy. I sort of built in a plan for disassembly when I first made this system in the she shed. I put this extra line to nowhere with a valve on it so I could empty out the main tank. Unfortunately, that doesn't really service the radiator loop. And since I had two fairly large radiators that that rain outside the she shed, they contain quite a bit of bit cool with no easy way to empty it out. So I did it the messy way and just cut the pipes. I sort of managed to catch some of the dielectric fluid as it spilled out, but I sure hope Gary Testa's being honest when he says this stuff is safe and totally biodegradable because I lost a lot of it onto my lawn. Next up, it was just a matter of chopping up the pipes, saving all the 90 degree turns so I could use them in the next system and hauling this stuff out to my truck. Unfortunately, everything is heavy and awkward and slippery and spilling out oily substance everywhere. So if you're doing this in like a cleaner environment, prepare for your future. Remember to add ways to truly empty the whole system when you're designing the pipes. I got everything over to the warehouse and onto my test bench to put it together. I reused this big tank as a water reservoir. I had put this thing together for my two miner setup a couple of iterations ago. It already has half inch CPVC piped into the bottom of it, so it's perfect. Okay. I'm sweaty. We've got this S19 J Pro in this tank that I got from Engineered Fluids, in this acrylic tank. What we need to make happen is the fluid that comes out of the discharge of this tank is gonna go into this pump. From this pump, it's gonna run through this heat exchanger, through the heat exchanger, back into the tank. The dielectric fluid loop is literally just out of the tank, through the pump, through the heat exchanger, back into the tank. That's that's the only place that there is dielectric fluid, the only place that there's oily fluid. And then this whole side is gonna be water. So this tank is gonna be full of water. It's gonna come out of the heat exchanger into this tank. It's gonna be super hot water in the tank. From the tank to a pump, from the pump to this radiator, from this radiator, back into the heat exchanger. Oh, and then from the heat exchanger, back into the water again. So that there's a water loop, hot water, there's an oil loop. I don't even know if you call it oil. There's a dielectric fluid loop. I'm reusing as much of the CPVC as I could from the previous system, so that's why there's like various ball valves that make no sense. It's also why everything is really oily. The only difficult thing for this particular setup is these are one inch NPT threaded holes and I'm going into half inch NPT threaded everything else. Could have kept everything one inch, but these pumps are way cheaper when you get them smaller. That's all the flow I really needed. Speaking of flow. You only get a second once you've applied this stuff. And the, I think what it's doing is like melting the PVC to the PVC. I thought it'd be good to put some foam on here so that it would quiet everything down. One inch to three quarter inch, three quarter inch to half inch, half inch to half inch MPT threads. That's the in. You gotta make sure you look on your pump. The pump does mark, it has a little thing that says out. hot in the warehouse today. 92 degrees Fahrenheit in the warehouse today. Luckily, CPVC is pretty forgiving. Okay, the dielectric coolant side should be done. We could even fill it up. This takes like, I don't know, 10 minutes to cure. I forgot to put a T-valve anywhere in this thing. This liquid won't make its way down in and through here. The pump I think only goes one way maybe or something. Without putting a T-valve in here, this can't fill up. It stays full of air. The pump can't prime. I need to cut one in, but I think as soon as I cut this, that's going to allow air to go in there, which means all this dielectric fluid is gonna to try to push through there 
and squirt out the top of there so I'll have just like a second. I'm just gonna erase that thing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna glue this up, I'm gonna cut this pipe, and I'm gonna try to put it all together before the dielectric fluid makes it to there and then hope that the glue can just do its thing. Get that ready. This was not a manufacturer crisis. This is, I'm stupid. I only have like 10 seconds once this glue goes on. Glue. That's cut. That's assembled, starting to come out. Cap it. Oh, I can't cap it that way. <laughs> That's gonna be pressurized. That needs glue on it, and I can't put glue on it when it's full of oil. We're just gonna see what happens. That might leak. It might not. Okay, that's almost all of it. This tank is gonna need to be full of water. So I'm just gonna go out of the heat exchanger and just let it drain into the tank. Probably wanna keep this closed if it was permanent just so the water wouldn't evaporate quickly because it's gonna be hot water. But in this test environment, that's okay. Let's we'll leave that open. The water's actually gonna be really dirty. I'm gonna clean the inside of that tank. Testing the dielectric loop. That's not what I want to see. Okay, we got to take some out. There's no clean way to do that. It's going to make a horrible mess. Lowering the level. good. That's perfect. It's not leaking. God, this pump is really quiet. The dielectric loop is ready. Okay, now that I've got the bit cool loop working the way I want it to, we got to test out the water loop, see if there's any leaks in that. Water has bigger molecules than bit cool though, so I feel pretty good about it. So the water loop has to fill up the entire radiator, the pump, and all these lines, and the heat exchanger back again. So I'm guessing 10 gallons should do it. may need to get air out. Woo! Okay. Let's get that wired in. We'll just plug it in, turn it on, and see what the numbers say. Where do you plug it in? Over there. I guess there was some air trapped in the power supply. That's interesting. All right, now that I've got this running, I'm just gonna let it go for a couple of hours, maybe like four or five hours, cause I mean, it started with cool, bit cool, and I don't know, 10 or 15 gallons of cool water. It's gonna take a pretty long time to like heat that up to whatever the equilibrium is. Right now we are hashing at about 110 terahash, which me is a little overclocked. This is the uh, ASIC.to overclock that I got running. So that's gonna be pulling like, I don't know, 3,500 watts or so. so. That should heat everything up pretty quick. Also right now my exit temperature is 113 Fahrenheit, which is 45 degrees Celsius. And that's how hot the bit cool on the way out is. We'll see you back here in a couple hours. After stabilizing, we have max temperatures in the mid 70s C, so about the same temperatures I was getting cooling the bit cool directly through two radiators. I did take off the overclock and run it stock 104 terahash. And keep in mind, I'm in a non air conditioned warehouse in the summertime in Florida. It's over 90 degrees Fahrenheit ambient temperatures in here. On the water side, it settled at 103 and a half degrees Fahrenheit, which is just under 40 degrees Celsius, and that's after it hits the heat exchanger. I don't have a way to test the temperature of the water before it hits the heat exchanger to see what the delta is, the amount of heat the radiator 
radiator rings out. I should really get some sort of CPVC port with a thermometer built into it. The exit temperature of the bit cool on the hot side of the miner tank is just under 48 degrees Celsius, which is 118 degrees Fahrenheit. But Nicholas, single phase, single loop cooling was working just about the same. Why two loops? Well, I'm glad you asked me. See this capped off half inch CPVC pipe right here? A byproduct of the two loop cooling system, at least the way that I have it set up here, is a tank full of really hot water or water glycol mix if you're in a place where it might freeze. A guy could tap into that tank and give that hot water all sorts of jobs to do. Let's say you live in a northern climate where for at least half the year it's pretty cold outside. You could run a system of pipes under your floorboards that circulates this hot water to continuously heat the floor. I've got family in Colorado that has a system like that that runs through their driveway. Hey Jane. Hey Randy. It just comes back into the garage and is heated heated up with essentially a hot plate. He never has to shovel his driveway. The snow just melts on contact. Although it probably costs a bit to keep that hot all winter. You could pipe this into a second heat exchanger for a pool or a hot tub. You could circulate it through your hot water heater. A continuous 3000 watts of heat forever will take a massive load off of whatever heater you've got running on whatever system already. And don't forget, these things make money rather than cost money. In Florida though, where I live, all we ever do is try to get rid of heat, which is technically the first half of what this whole system is for. And the reason I'm experimenting with it is that water is a whole whole lot cheaper than Bitcool, like thousands of times cheaper. So my Bitcool cooling loop stays really small and it's almost silent. Then I can just run these CPVC pipes on the water side all the way out to the backyard of the warehouse where the radiator, the tank, the second pump, and that big fan will all live outside permanently and not bother anybody. And actually, now that this project is done, I think I'm gonna go get started on that now.